Hello and welcome to this, the latest episode of the Lazar Wellbeing Show. Thank you very much for joining. And I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Lucy Pollock here today to have a conversation about something that lots of us are sometimes reluctant or even a bit scared to talk about, and that is ageing. Now, Lucy trained in Cambridge and at St. Bart's Hospital and went on to specialise in caring for the elderly and the frail. During her 20 years as a consultant, she has become a trusted go-to expert when it comes to living and ageing with dignity. She's now based in Somerset. Her extensive experience of caring for the elderly has led her to write an honest, compassionate and sometimes very funny book, answering the questions about ageing that we are often too afraid to ask. Her book is called The Book About Getting Older, and it recognises a problem with how we relate to and look after the frail and the elderly and reframes the whole ageing process as something to be celebrated. It's not something that we often get the opportunity to talk frankly about, so I'm really thrilled to introduce Lucy and excited to hear what you think about our chat. So let me know on Instagram after you have listened. And without further ado, let's get right into the episode. So Lucy, welcome to the podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you here. This is such a timely conversation to be having. Thank you for giving up your time because I know you are still very much a practicing doctor in the thick of it. So we're really fortunate that you've given up your time. Thank you. Liz, thank you. It's a real pleasure, a real honour to be here. Oh, well, you're very kind. And what I'd love to know before we get into talking about your work with the frail and the elderly is really how that all happened. What what was your journey as a a young medical student and as a young doctor? Um, Okay, I I, um, knew I was going to do medicine from a very early age. I had both of my parents were doctors and it it becomes an inescapable destiny for some of us. And um, And then I started my training once I qualified and I did lots of different medical specialties as as you do and you rotate from one to another and I was very lucky. I enjoyed them all. I enjoyed lots of different specialties and I really did not know what I was going to end up doing. I knew I was going to be a physician rather than a surgeon. I I definitely wasn't any good at the surgery, Um, but I wasn't at all sure. And then I went for a meeting with the person who ran our training and he was fantastic. And he listened to what I was interested in. And there was a long pause. And then he said, Lucy, I'm sorry, I, I hope you won't be offended. But I think you should do geriatric medicine. And I knew immediately, I thought, I don't know why I hadn't thought of that before. Of course, I'm going to do geriatric medicine. It's, it's a fantastic specialty. Yeah. So she said it, I knew that was what I needed to do. And I got myself a registrar training post in geriatric medicine. And I haven't really stopped since. So why why was there potential for you to be offended? Is it seen as a bit of a sort of Cinderella specialty? It has been in the past. And one of the joys of having been a geriatrician for the last quarter of a century or so is watching it blossom as a as a specialty and come into its own. And it was interesting in the early days, geriatric medicine attracted a, a disparate group, and it still does, but a lot of the uh, people that were interested were very clever and very interesting people, and they were a little bit different from a lot of other specialists. And I, I'd quite like to think that they still are. Um, I think it has become a specialty that more and more people realise is important and interesting. The science behind it has blossomed. Mm. There's a huge amount of science behind our practice now. Um, And yet it retains the absolute essence of medicine in terms of being about human beings, about real life. Mm -hmm. And that combination is is unbeatable. And and it attracts young doctors in droves now. It's a really competitive specialty. And some of my young doctors and the best of them go into geriatric medicine. And when we talk about geriatric medicine, what's the what's the definition? Who who do you see, and, oh, and what, what would yes. they be presenting? With? That's yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. We don't define uh, geriatric medicine by age, and we define it 
by need uh, in almost every department in the UK. Um, and it, it's really hard to say who is it that needs to see a geriatrician. Um, so GPs often have a good feel for the patients of theirs who might mostly are older, not everybody is older. Occasionally I see people in their 60s who, who need to see a geriatrician. But what they do have in common is they tend to have problems that are complicated and multiple. So quite a lot of my, certainly most of my patients have got more than one condition. Right. Um, they have multiple medications. Um, when people come into hospital as well, how do people decide which ward, you know, who should go onto a ward that is where the consultant is a geriatrician as opposed to a cardiologist or a respiratory physician? Um, and again, they're a group that the, the nurses know who need, to, who need our help. And so often it's people who may be confused, who may already have some problems with memory, but or have don't have problems with memory until now they've got an infection or something mm. uh, and got complicated medication regimes and a lot of my patients will be frail so there'll be people who need help at home um, whose families are beginning to pick up things for them or who have you know formal carers coming in so that's another thing that's lovely about the specialty it's a very team-based specialty there are a lot of people involved and working right across then presumably physical ailment and mental absolutely exactly that so so um uh, in this specialty you have to think about every aspect of somebody's life it's not just about getting their heart right it's about thinking about what their walking's like whether they're steady on their feet whether they're going to be able to take all these fancy medicines that you've chosen for them Mm -hmm. actually it's going to be a step too far um how are they going to manage when they get home uh, so it, it's about more than just treating the immediate condition in front of you. Mm. And are there stereotypes that persist to do with the elderly and the frail that perhaps we need to unpack here? That's that's a, a good question. And yes, there definitely are. And in fact, there's a whole debate to be had about the language that we use. Right. So, for example, older people, we tend to say older people and we tend not to say the elderly because older people don't really like all being called the elderly and because they're not all one collective group of people, they're all individual people. Um, so, uh, and uh, there are stereotypes, that, there are phrases that just pop up the whole time. One of my favourite, and all geriatricians would recognise it, is the fiercely independent. You know, we say, oh, this this lady, she's fiercely independent. Yeah. Just, what does that actually mean? Yes, shouldn't um, we all be fiercely independent? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but it usually suggests that it's somebody who won't take your advice. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes with a note of uh, it comes with a note of frustration. But of course, in fact, we all would want to be fiercely independent as we get older. It sounds as though there's a lot of sort of sensitivity around the language that's used, and also the way you talk. To people and, and I know you've written about that in your book about how to how to better talk to people who are older. Absolutely so I mean I think a lot of older people have had experience of being inadvertently patronized oh. and the people saying calling them dear or calling them by their first name. I'm driven absolutely nuts by the fact that a lot of older people don't mind at all being called by their first name, provided you get that name right. And lots of older people are not actually called by their first name. They're called by my, their middle name. My husband is called by his middle name. My stepfather is called by his middle name. But if you go anywhere near, near a hospital, nobody mm. ever asks. They always assume that the name at the front of your name is the one that you're going to be called by. Um, and I've made that mistake plenty of times. So just getting people's name right is a good step in the right direction. And then, yes, it's it's so easy to. Um, uh, my aunt the other day had had an, uh, a difficult time at a hospital appointment, and somebody apologised to her and said, oh, "I'm sorry, you were upset." And she said, "I wasn't upset. I was incandescent. <laughs> it made me sound as though I was some. You know, she's 91, but she wasn't upset. She was furious. Yeah, uh, it, it's easy to." Um, to get it wrong um and it's usually easy to get it right yes good well you've got lots of hints and tips for us which are 
so, so front of mind at the moment. And I think with so much focus, having been on care homes, perhaps, and coping with loneliness. Yes. And the sense of despair amongst so many who are older. Yes. What's your advice there? That's it's such a big, big, That's big, a big question. Sorry. Yes. And I, I, I. I wrote this book really before COVID and um, although I have put some pieces in about COVID, it's, we, you know, it is very important, but actually all the things that are important about being older now were already important before and loneliness and isolation is pretty near the top of the list. And the way that our society is structured so that people are, are in, increasingly isolated is something that we really need to get hold of because this is not right. And it's not only older people that um, are disadvantaged, but actually the rest of us are too. If we don't include older people in our lives, we're missing out on a great wealth of knowledge and experience and funny stories. And, yes. you know, it's, it's insane to do that. So when we come through this situation, I think it'll be very interesting to see how we tackle that. But while we're in it, what can individuals do? I think simply picking up the phone, um, using technology, learning to use technology, not being afraid of it, using FaceTime is just magical. I love watching someone's face when they work out, they can see their grandchildren on FaceTime. Yes. Um, and uh, being neighborly and knocking on someone's door and just making sure mm. It's through saying, I, are you okay? Just re remembering that. And uh, there's lots that we can do that are just little steps towards making people included. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, b before COVID, of course, there were wonderful things happening and lots of good organisations are still working really hard to make sure that people are not isolated. And we need to keep the momentum of that work. That's going to be very important. A lot of people obviously are caring for elderly members of the family at home, mm -hmm. so, you know, and that obviously brings its own challenges. Mm -hmm. What are the sort of early warning signs that somebody may be beginning to slip into cognitive decline? What are the sort of the, yes. the worries that we perhaps, you know, I, I classify myself as a sort of midlife woman with older parents. Yep. And I'm always interested to know what we should be looking for, the early warning signs, if you like. Yes. Okay. And and I think uh, a lot of people, I mean, I, I'm in the same situation, are uh, in midlife with, it's a, a crucible really, isn't it? It's mm. old parents, it's a job that's busy and it's children who may or may not have left home but are needing all kinds of interesting support and then who knows what's going on with your other half etc you know there's there's so much to think about been oh, there big time yes yeah, it's a very familiar situation um and so thinking about I think it's that that's a good question and I'd bring it back to an an example so um what what often happens is say sort of um Joan's family might start picking things up, noticing that bills aren't being paid, and they and they just say, Oh mum, let's set up a direct debit for that one, it'd be easier. Or noticing that maybe the house isn't as tidy as it was, or that there are accidents in the car and driving is a really big oh, one. Yeah. Um, and those can be early warning signs. And I, I teach my medical students, they always think that signs of cognition are things like forgetting you know, what, what your name is and whether you've had lunch and things like that and how to get to the loo. And of course, those things do happen, but actually they happen very, very late in dementia. What we start noticing is I say it's the sort of things that my teenage children are learning. So how to drive, how to plan holidays, how to plan to see your friends. Um, you might notice that her parent isn't making any social arrangements anymore. Mm. Um, they're um, maybe becoming a little bit more isolated, maybe a bit less interested in how the world is working. Um, so, and those aren't disastrous signs on their own, but they're just little warning signals that mm. you might need to start thinking about whether this is a problem or actually whether somebody may be becoming depressed. That's a common, right. common condition and it's... Good and overlooked 
And is that because we sort of are genetically going to get more depressed as we age? No, no. The really lovely thing is that it looks as though we get happier as we get older. Okay. So why is that? Because we don't notice that, much what's going on around us. <laughs> yes, it's really interesting. It's studies from all over the world show that you're pretty happy in your twenties. You get a bit less happy as you go through some difficult patches in thirties and forties. And in the UK, the sort of nadir, the bottom end of happiness, is when you're about forty-nine. And then after that, everything starts picking up and it looks as though at least to the age of 75 you go on getting happier and and uh, it's very very encouraging news thank you for that one (laughs) oh no it's good and actually even people into their 80s and 90s are often a great deal happier than younger people would imagine them to be so we make judgments about people's quality of life and we base it on what we are ourselves think Oh, you know, I wouldn't want to be sitting in my house all day and not going out very often. Actually, if you ask somebody older how they regard themselves, they're happy. They're not everybody's happy, but a lot of people are actually very happy, contented. And so this gloomy picture, this bleak picture of old age is all wrong. Very, really interesting and, and, and really encouraging too. You mentioned there earlier about accidents while driving. Mm. Is there a time when we might perhaps need to have that very difficult conversation with a parent? Yes. Uh, And it's a conversation. Yes, it absolutely is. And it can be a conversation you need to have more than once. So you may end up only having it once because there's been a a defining incident, an accident, which means that they really need to, to stop or they've had a medical condition diagnosed, which means they're not allowed to drive anymore. But much more commonly, there's a problem of just becoming a bit less good at it Mm. and judgment being a little bit impaired and reflexes being slower and this is in people who are otherwise doing very nicely and fine and so that can be really awkward and we have to be careful about what kind of standards we set people um so it it is a tricky one to be fair most older people know themselves when they ought to stop driving so Actually, most people hang up their car keys at the right moment. It does get a bit more tricky when it's someone who really doesn't. Mm-hmm. And how would you broach the subject? Would you sort of go out for a drive with them and be talking? Yes, I've got saying, I've got lovely friends who, you know, did you notice this? And, and yes, and so that that can be a nice way of doing it without making it be a test. Mm because it's not fair to put pressure on. But I've got lovely friends who've done that with their parents, just sat quietly in the car and keep keep quiet, don't give directions, but just see what's happening. And that can be a real confidence boost. You know, if you get to the supermarket and back and you're able to say, actually, mum, I think you're fine. That's a lovely thing to be able to do. Yeah. But sometimes people are more tricky than that. And, you know, if a car is covered in dents and bruises, you think, mm, this- mm we need to have a conversation you you could involve your local gp could you to have a conversation so i've i've written about this quite carefully in the book because that is a common misconception that gps are going to be able to tell somebody to stop driving that actually isn't the case apart from for a few clearly defined medical conditions like uh, you know you're not allowed to drive for a defined period after a stroke for example but then you may be able to drive or with visual impairment there is some very clear guidance about exactly how much vision you need to be able to drive and, and the DPA sets those rules um, for the sort of less obvious things like people who are just getting a little bit of mild cognitive impairment actually GPs are not in an easy position there um, they can they can give some advice, but nobody has to take it. Right. <laughs> so that is quite difficult. And the other thing is that they're bound by confidentiality rules, and the rules of confidentiality are well, it, it's guidance rather than rules, but it's pretty good guidance, and you don't you don't go around it. Mm. So we do really respect people's confidentiality, and we have to do that. So actually. Often the best people to have a conversation with somebody about their driving, it is the family and the family can report somebody to the DVLA. If you absolutely have to, that's the way forward. Really? You can do that anonymously. And actually, in my experience, the DVLA are fantastic. They're very, very fair. They will arrange for somebody to be assessed if there's enough concern and and people can access a very fair driving assessment. 
Oh, that's really interesting. I had no idea that you could do that. That's really encouraging, and to be able to do that anonymously as well. So, yes, the I'm, they're not kind of playing the bad guy. Yes, exactly. So it's not. I mean, I would certainly say have the conversation first. Mm. Try, mm. try have a, an agreement yeah. about it. It's much easier. But it. But for the odd person who where you're really stuck and they are absolutely not listening, mm. um, then that can be the way around it really yeah really practical advice thank you talking about cognitive impairment can you clarify for me and and maybe for others listening the difference between alzheimer's and dementia oh okay yeah so dementia in itself isn't really a single illness it's a collection of symptoms and that can include problems with memory but also organizational skills and um orientation you know knowing where you are and so on so lots of different things and there are actually lots of illnesses that can cause dementia and alzheimer's is the number one of those so um the, the second one is is vascular dementia which happens when you've had little tiny strokes and bits of the all one big bad stroke um and bits of the brain that are to do with thinking rather than with moving are affected and quite a lot of people have both a bit of uh, alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia and then there are uh, quite a lot of other sorts um, of dementia as well. So I think people quite often think of Alzheimer's disease as being this particularly terrible kind of illness where people really are, have no ability to look after themselves. That isn't the case. An awful lot of people who've got Alzheimer's disease are living very happy, normal lives, maybe with some support from family, it's still very active. Uh, still engaged in lots and lots of activities, including cognitive activities. Um, yeah. And so it's um, it really covers a very broad range of, of, of conditions. And are there different ways to treat Alzheimer's? And oh, dementia? yes, there are. Um, the really sad thing is that we haven't yet got good medication for Alzheimer's disease, and I think everybody knows that. Um, and it's there will be, but there are there are there isn't yet. But there are some medications that are licensed in Alzheimer's disease, and for a lot of people early on in the illness, I think they are worth trying. And that's one of the reasons why it probably is worth knowing um, that you know to get the diagnosis right. Mm. For some people, those tablets can make a lot of difference. For most people, they make a very little difference. And for some people, they make absolutely no difference at all. Right. Um, so, and they also don't work forever. So, you know, that they are not uh, by no means a panacea. Um, but the other important thing on the on the journey towards a dementia diagnosis is, is making sure that it's not something else. People often jump to a conclusion and think, oh, you know, that. That must be Alzheimer's, and it's a very easy label to put on somebody's notes or for a family to think. Um, and then actually, you do a bit more work, and you think actually that's not what it is. This is something true. I've come across actually many um, women in older life going through menopause mm. who have have said to me, "I, I was convinced that I was yes. dementia because the yeah. estrogen levels were, were plummeting in my brain yeah. and I just couldn't remember things. My cognitive function was so impaired. Oh, that, that so happened to me. Absolutely. I, I just, I couldn't find the word. I mean, I still not brilliant at finding the words, but you know, every time you want one, yeah. you just have to send somebody out to find that word. But, um, but yes, absolutely. And, and that, yeah, okay. Well, we won't talk about HRT, but for me, that made a big difference. That yeah, well, you know, I'm a massive fan. I mean, you have to prize it out of my dying hand, I tell you. <laughs> it's really interesting to look. I mean, this is a, a sort of side segue, but it's interesting to look at the impact of estrogen on brain mm. health. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of interesting studies now going on, particularly with it, yeah, Alzheimer's and estrogen. Yes. I mean, and at the moment, I don't think there's enough evidence to say that we should all be taking it. And I certainly wouldn't feel guilty about not taking HRT. And I've got lots of plastic friends who don't and they look a million dollars and they seem to be doing very nicely and they're very brainy but for some people it definitely makes a difference yeah, yeah. interesting really mm. interesting anything else that we should be doing to help you know we talk about medication but you know do you encourage mm. doing crossword puzzles and, oh and- that's yes and uh, sudokus as well yeah. yes the thing about doing sudokus if you do lots of sudokus you get very good at sudokus um <laughs> 
So what what is interesting is that doing a variety of things definitely makes a difference. And so trying to keep active, I often say do more, not less. And that's advice I've had from patients. You know, this idea that you should sort of slide into your slippers when you've retired and, and sit and watch the golf all day. Absolutely not. So keeping, it's in a way, it's a bit like having a varied diet. Yeah. It's have, have a varied life, do different things, read a different book. You know, buy yourself a different newspaper once a week and um, a different point of view that's really interesting you can really annoy yes. yourself by reading a newspaper that oh you know. yes exactly <laughs> drive yourself mad by talking to somebody you disagree with yes, and, yeah. um, that, that kind of thing um, it, it, it is tremendous I mean another silly thing but actually really important is if you've got hearing problems try and get them sorted out yeah. um, because I think we've almost noticed during lockdown, I don't know about you, but I think a lot of people have felt their intellectual faculties reducing as our interactions have reduced. And in a way, that's a parallel with losing hearing. You are just not picking up as much that is exciting. Yeah. Well, our world has sort of shrunk, hasn't it? Yes. As, as we're, yeah. as we're not travelling and for many of yeah. us, it's literally shrunk to the kind of the, the four mm-hmm. minutes that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, if, if if I ring a friend who is hard of hearing, it, it's very difficult because it's very difficult for them to hear. And I think it's lovely yes. that we've got technology like we're using now. Where we can actually see each other. Yes. And it has actually got simpler, hasn't it? I mean, I know in the old days, computers and things would be really hard. But yes. with a tablet, it, you just press a button and there you are. It's it is relatively yes. simple. Yes. Yes, I, I, and lots of people, lots of older people have engaged brilliantly with that. I, uh, it, It's not for everyone, and we mustn't mm. overlook the fact that people are missing physical contact so desperately. Absolutely badly. right. Oh, my goodness. I remember um, talking to somebody a while back, talking about the power of touch and saying, you know, mm. three hugs mm. a day, that's my prescription for everybody. You know, hug somebody three times a day, minimum. And yes. you think, well, where has that gone? I mean, and if you're Absolutely. living on your own, I was talking to a physio recently who said she touched somebody who hadn't been touched for, well, since the end of March, had uh, not it, a physical hand on them. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And it's awesome. not devastating i agree and and actually i was rereading i was reading the audio book of, uh, of the book and realized how often i talk about touching my patients or touching a, a yeah. family member when we're in a situation where somebody needs comfort or, yeah. or there's a you know there's a scene where I'm terribly cross about something and somebody else the touch of someone else just brings me back into being able to think clearly about a problem that has become very emotional yeah. God, mm. no, talking about that obviously leads into the inevitable questions about how we deal with really difficult mm. discussions we're talking about end of life Yes. And, you know, we're so good, aren't we, about talking about birth and, you know, the joyful things. Um, But I think, is it they say that death and taxes are the only two unavoidable things in life? Yep. And yet we simply don't talk about death. It's Yeah, um, most of us, yeah, we would rather do our, yeah, we do, we'd rather do our tax return than talk to (laughs) mum. It's Do you have those conversations? Yes, all all the time, Liz. And what I have learned, and and this is really partly, I mean, I've written the book about life and there's lots in it about the enjoyment of life and maintaining joy and happiness and independence in life. Um, But I don't want to shy away from the conversations about the end because if we get the end right, oh my golly, it makes everything so much better. And having conversations makes the end go well. Um, and I've just seen it over and over again, how a family or an older person themselves, this burden is lifted off their shoulders in these conversations. And if you reach, can have one of these difficult conversations, like, so it, they are frightening things to think about, but let, I'm thinking about a patient of mine, uh, Betty, who was really independent and well, and her daughters had told me how fantastic she was still driving and so on. And she had a stroke out of the blue. It was really sad, a horrible big stroke. And she wasn't ever going to be able to, to speak again. And there was a, um, wasn't was able to communicate what she wanted. And there was a conversation about whether we should be feeding her by tube because she wasn't able to swallow anymore. And what was really lovely in that situation was that she had addressed that with her daughters and she'd sat them down. In fact, several times she'd mentioned it. She hadn't written it down, but she'd had a really good, honest conversation about what 
wouldn't, wouldn't want. And it was just one of those situations where those two women looked at one another and they said, we know what mum, we know mum on this. And but at what stage should we be having those conversations then? So it, that's a, that is a, a good question. My feeling is that actually, if we could normalise them, we would have them more often and more easily. Mm. But if family that's in that situation, also, I think the other important thing is older people quite often would like to have that conversation, but they don't know how to start it either. Right. So finding, having the right words to start that conversation is a good place to start. Um, and then often it's a little hint of something something happens and it may be an illness that an older person has or a fall or something or often it's some uh, the um, death of a spouse or of a friend or a friend moving into care or something on television or anything can prompt a conversation and the key thing is not to duck it if that moment appears yeah just don't duck it and you know I watch I watch sometimes you know, even somebody really, really frail in hospital, like, you know, I'm thinking of um, Pat the other day and her granddaughter's visiting and Pat is so fragile. And she said, oh, I don't think I'm going to see my next birthday. And this granddaughter, so sweet and leans in and puts her hand on her and says, oh, Nan, don't speak like that. You'll be fine. And she just, it's so instinctive to protect somebody but actually better not to, better to say, oh, uh, that's a sad thought, but maybe you're right. Perhaps we should talk about that. Fantastic. Mm, and, opening, and, isn't it? Uh, yes. And also absolutely. when things happen to other people, mm. I had a family member who had a, a, a massive stroke and was mm -hmm. then on, on life support and then and sadly died. And it did actually start the conversation. Well, what if that was me? What if that was yes. you? What would you want to happen? Because yes. there's big questions about, you know, is the machine turned off? What what do we do? Uh, you know, and, and you can then start playing out various scenarios, can't you? Yes, absolutely. And I think they do require courage, these moments. And again, it's something that I have given some practical advice about what kind of form of words you can use if you need to have that conversation you even start thinking about it in your own head um and also what you know do you need to write it down do you need a lawyer no you don't um but you know where can you get some advice um how, how do you make sure that if you are if you've got some very firm views how do you make sure that they're recorded um but actually you, you know it isn't really about uh, recording things and getting them written down in a very important, you know, very clear format. Actually, it's just having the conversation that's the really good start. Mm. Um, and that it's uh, every time I think about it, I I can just picture time and again someone who is relieved, um, patients yeah. and families, and they are relieved to have those conversations. That's that's really good to know. That's really encouraging. I think for anybody who's mm. thinking gosh this is a conversation that I need to have what about mm. things like living wills and and DNR yes okay I mean are, are they real things are they things that you deal with in your work uh absolutely yes very much they're more uh spoken about than actually present so uh, the other thing is that we get ourselves in a complete tangle of nomenclature so uh, we talk about advanced care plans and we talk about treatment escalation plans and we talk advanced decisions to re refuse treatment and uh, we talk about advanced statements and they are all really important subjects and we get in a complete model about what each of them are, you know, which one's a living will, which one is legally binding, which one isn't, which one is just about what music you'd like to have if you were unwell and which one is about what treatment you'd like to have, which is a completely different thing. So. It, it is important to have some understanding and, and it's very easy for people to get um, a bit flawed, actually. You, you know, you think, OK, I, I want to make some plans. How do I do it? Where yeah. am I supposed to write and, it? And, and what's legal? I, I mean, presumably yes. you're, you're, you're covering this in your book with, yeah. with, with ideas of where to go and, yeah. and templates. And, you know, yeah. I guess for all of us, because death is a certainty, 
it's kind of a thing that almost at any age or certainly from your middle years onwards yeah it's not a bad idea is it just to to jot down should the worst happen yeah um, you know the proverbial bus comes along uh, and I don't make it yes home, uh, or I make it home but in a vegetative state what what would I actually want to happen uh, absolutely Liz uh, I think it's very interesting that some people, I mean, I've made mine, I've written mine down and it's some time ago because it isn't really about me, it's about my family. And I don't want them to be in a situation in which they're making, frankly, agonizing decisions. That's a really great way of looking at it. And, you know, when you are thinking about that as, as a very sad thing, you know, potentially as a situation that you might find yourself in, mm-hmm. but actually to be thinking, okay, how can I make this? better yes everybody else in my family by actually taking the decision to do this now and maybe actually that's a way to bring up a conversation with somebody who's older yes by saying i've done this because this is a really important thing for the family you know have you had any thoughts about it yes uh, exactly and it is that shared experience and so in the book i use quite a lot of stories about my patients and their families and how they have individually approached these. So it's not just a kind of list of here's the guidance and this is what you do and and you need to sign it and date it and witness it. It isn't like that. I do cover the practicalities and the GMC guidance and what the law says and things like that. So I, I, I explain those, but I also very much use individual stories to illustrate how families have, have, have sorted these things out. Mm. They're, they are emotional conversations. We can't get away from that. And that is what makes them so difficult to talk about. So it's this bizarre combination of because you're talking with somebody you love, you can't because you love them too much. You can't talk about something awful happening. Yes. Because you love them, it's the most important conversation. It is, isn't it? How can we make death better, do you think? Uh, talking about it is a very good place to start and realizing that death done well and lots of people do death very very well I think a lot of families have had experience of someone's departure being peaceful and actually being beautifully done and they have very warm memories of a really good death so uh, but that's not true for everyone. I think it is almost always better if you've made some kind of plan. And that means that the people that are there can respect your wishes and can do what you would have wanted. And you, you've heard that expression. People say, oh, it's what dad was, would have wanted. Yeah. Going like that. Oh, that's the way he would have wanted. It's a lovely thing to be able to say. Um, but you can only say it if you know what he would have wanted. Yes. And I guess in all of this, there's also joy. You talked earlier about mm. joy and happiness being covered in the book as well and celebrating that that joyfulness and that longevity, yes. which hopefully we all aspire to. Yes, and we should. And that's the other thing is I think that for some reason, well, for many reasons, old age is often framed in these this very bleak framework and, and we talk about the finances and the economy and, and carers and the rest of it. And we forget that actually it's fantastic. Mm. Have years in retirement is a real bonus. People didn't have 100 years ago. They retired and died. And mm. now you have this lovely period, if, well, if, you're, if you're lucky and most people are, you have this amazing period after you've retired where you can do things that you're interested in. You can spend time with your friends and your family. You can watch grandchildren grow up. You can go and join the local history society or go and watch ducks and you can do whatever you want to do. And, and we forget about that. And, and instead we've got all this hand wringing and we shouldn't have hand wringing. We should be saying, this is fantastic. How are we going to make it as good as it can possibly be? Yeah, how fortunate. It is always, it's looking at the positives, isn't it? And just being grateful for those extra years and, you know, perhaps mindful of those that haven't had them. Yes. And celebrating that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was such an interesting, and I know it will have been for many, a really thought provoking conversation. And your book is so important. I wish you huge success with it. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Liz. I have really enjoyed just 
being allowed to talk with you. It's been a treat. Thank you. And that's it for today's episode. As always, you will find all the links and the resources that we mentioned on today's show over on lazarwellbeing.com. There you can sign up for the free weekly newsletter that's filled with plenty more expert information about living and ageing well. Huge thanks to all of you, as always, who leave us such lovely reviews, especially on iTunes. It really does help others to find the show and widen the net. So until the next time we chat, go well. Bye bye. The Liz Earle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Liz Earle, with production by Amara Liz Earle and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue, with thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, guest booker, Millie de la Mornier, and assistant researcher, Martha Comford. <laughs>